Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Loretta Ferris. I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Transformation. I um, started in this job about a week ago. And so it is my pleasure to welcome you to this course and to also introduce to you um, Dr. Uma, who is our expert um, in, in this area and um, who has kindly agreed to speak to you about um, African literature in this in this moment, and and I think it's a, it's perhaps a good moment to to talk about this as. Um, you may be aware that at UCT we're beginning to talk about this whole notion of decoloniality and what it means. And part of that is, of course, you know, the production of knowledge and what inspires that production of knowledge. And I think this cause, um, in a way, you know, the, the cause that focuses on that moment of transitioning um, from colonization to decolonization, um, this cause kind of uh, grapples with with the experience that authors brought to that, the kind of disillusionment. And what we are seeing now is that that's a moment that has not ended, right, in the, um, in the mid-60s. So this is a moment that, that is continuing and that's actually part of the now. Um, and of course, the gender component um, that was awakened at that process, and now we're talking about intersectionalities and what it means. So I think it's going to be exciting to, to, to bring together what it means and, and how it's conveyed through, through literature. And like I said, we have Dr. Uma, who's really, um, who has the expertise to, to, to bring this course to you. Um, He's a lecturer in our department in, in, at UCT at the Department of English Language and Literature. And his research interest and publication looks at a whole range of, of, of issues, including the African diaspora. Um, he looks at, at, in this context of, of the diaspora, of new diasporic African identities. He looks at uh, popular culture and the representation of childhood as well as the way in which um, gender feeds into, into all of this. So with that, welcome. I'll give over to, to Dr. Uma, and I hope you enjoy this course. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Loretta Ferris, for that generous introduction. Uh, I'm just going to adjust the, uh, the mic so that I'm a little clearer. welcome you all uh, to this lecture once again. And uh, I can see f familiar faces from last year. This is the second um, set of lectures I'm giving in the summer school. Um, last year, I gave lectures on contemporary African literature. And I was trying to reflect on um, the present moment of African literature in relation to uh, about five or six decades before that. Uh, in other words, you know, talking about the different generations of African literature. So last year, I was talking about the present kind of generation of African writers. And this year, I chose to go back to an earlier generation, um, precisely because South Africa is grappling with a similar moment that many other parts of the continent were, were grappling with in, in the first decade of independence. The first decade or two of independence, uh, a very crucial period in which expectations and hopes and desires um, become, they, you know, they come under very, very critical scrutiny. So I, I chose three writers who are by no means representative of that period. They simply uh, um, selected writers that can give you a sense of the larger zeitgeist, or the larger spirit of the times uh, in the first decade of, of independence. Um, and I'm hoping that most of you will, will have gotten your hands on any of the copies of, of the novels. I don't know if um, they're available at exclusives, but I, I think Many second-hand bookstores um, should have them. Can I, can I get a sense of um, from you guys whether you've been able to get any, any of those? Only this one. Only this one. Um, OK. Uh, uh, with the, the Bucci and Machetas, The Joys of Motherhood. Uh, yes? Uh, 
Ronde Bush Main Road, Protea Bookshop, all those copies there. Uh, please get your hands on them. Um, but also uh, the third novel that we're going to be looking at by Buccia Mecheta, which is titled The Joys of Motherhood. Uh, if you are a UCT alumni and you've got access to the library, um, there's an, um, there's a, uh, are, what, what, do you, what do they call them? The databases that have um, what we call the African Writer Series. So if you go to the UCT library homepage, if you can go online, uh, you'll be able to get a, a, an online copy um, from the database. So you go to the UCT website, library website, you click on databases, and then you um, go to, uh, it's alphabetized. So you go to A, and this is African Writer Series, and you can look at Buccia Mecheta, you'll be able to get uh, a free online copy that you can, I'm not sure you can download, but I think you can copy and paste. There might be um, uh, copyright issues in that regard, but uh, if you can read online, then you can get your hands on it. All right, so if I can just quickly frame, try and frame um, what I'm trying to talk about here, just to give you a sense of um, the, um, the different generations of African literature. Uh, by way of introduction, just to kind of give a scaffolding um, of, of what you're talking about. When we talk about modern African literature, um, I'm making reference to the literature that, that, that came with institutions uh, of the state, institutions of education, um, the, the, the kind of a setting up of publishing houses in the continent. And this was mostly uh, the period just before many African countries got their independence in the 50s, the 1950s, and then the 1960s. So, when I talk about modern African literature, that's what I mean. That's when these institutions have begun to grapple with what it means to talk about African stories, or to, to uh, articulate or talk about Africa through the various genres of fiction and, and drama and poetry and the setting up of institutions that would champion that. Um, the setting up of curriculum uh, uh, in, in universities and in, 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 in high schools that, that tried to um, give a sense of um, stories from the continent. So when I talk about modern African literature, that's what I mean. By no means does that, does that mean that there wasn't any African literature before that. And so what I have in front of me here is um, what I'm calling precursors to modern African literature. And, and I don't know if you recognize any of the names uh, on the board. Uh, someone like Solomon Plaki, um, you know, very famous South African author, uh, uh, published Moody. This was the, the, one of the earliest novels to be published in English by um, an African in 1930, even though he wrote it in 1918, 1919. Solomon Plaki was a South African who was one of the founding members of the South African Native National Congress, which later became what we know as the, Af the, the ANC, um, and is one of, one of the key figures who, um, in the early 20th century, was already publishing. And of course, there's R. 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 Lomo, also a South African. Um, there's Olado Equiano, whose um, kind of autobiography uh, was published in 1789. It's titled The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Equiano. He was a, a, a slave who was taken across the Atlantic um, to Europe at the time. And then there's, of course, Phyllis Whitley, uh, a famous uh, po poet um, who was already publishing before Olado Equiano in 1773. So there, and these are just a few you know, people who were publishing at the time. Now, when we talk about modern African literature, we can talk about the various generations of African literature. And the first generation, uh, just a few names that I'm putting out there. Um, I don't know if you recognize any of those names. Chinua Achebe and Gugi Othiongo, uh, Aikwe Yama, Peter Abrahams, who's a South African. I don't know if you recognize the name Peter Abrahams. Um, very interesting uh, um, writer because he, um, he left South Africa in the, in the, I think in the 50s, the 40s or the 50s, um, and he's never come back. And he's still alive, he lives in Jamaica, he's nine, uh, in about 97 or 98 years old. Uh, he refused to come back, and I'm going to touch on that when, when we start talking about Ngugi, Ngugi Othiongo as a grain of wheat, and tomorrow when we talk about Aikwe, Yamaze, Bitfluons, and Otiedbon. It's precisely the last 10 or 15 years of what South Africa has been going through politically uh, that someone like Peter Abrams was already grappling with in the, in the late 50s. There's something prophetic about the expectations and the, and the crisis of independence that he could already see. And so ideologically and in principle, he was opposed to coming back, I assume, because what we are going through now in South Africa was very much what was in his, mi in his mind at the time. 
And a few other writers there, Nuruddin Farah from Somalia, Bessie Head, um, you know, South African author as well, I'm sure you, you would have heard of her. Nadine Godim, obviously, Buche Mecheta. Um, so these are just names that I'm, I'm putting out there, or well, people who've been classified as the first generation of modern African writers. And if I can just quickly capture the, the spirit of the times using a quote from Chinua Achebe's um, book of essays called Hopes and Impediments, where he says that I'll be quite satisfied if my novels, especially the ones set in the past, did no more than teach my readers that their past, with all its imperfections, was not one long night of savagery from which the first Europeans acting on God's behalf delivered them. Perhaps what I write is applied art as distinct from pure, but who cares? Art is important, but so is education of the kind I have in mind. And I don't see that the two need to be mutually exclusive. This, for me, captures many of the concerns of this first generation of writers. History, the question of history, how does one deal with history, the subject and the discipline and the experience at that moment of independence? How does one begin to um, dig into an earlier archive? Uh, how does one begin to deal with the, the influence of, of, of European modernity uh, on, on the different forms of narrating history? And so many of the first generation of African writers were deeply concerned uh, with history and the connection between history and memory and trauma, and particularly um, the different genres in literature. So many of the novels of these writers often went back to an earlier time, often grappled with the crisis of memory and remembering after the trauma of colonialism. Um, and um, so this, for me, captures um, what many of these first generation writers are dealing with. And then there's a second generation of, of writers as well. And these are um, late 70s, early 80s. Um, you might recognize some of these names. Uh, Dambutso Marichera, Yvonne Vera, uh, Zimbabweans, uh, Titi Nangarembe, all of them Zimbabweans, Ben Okri, just a few names I'm putting out there. And if you read many of these second generation writers, you'll notice that they are children of the post-colonial moment. They were born when many of these countries already had their independence, and so they were, they were embodying some of the hopes, expectations, and the crisis of independence itself. And Ben Okri, um, who's a, a very, very important author from Nigeria, but he's Nigerian and British, um, has this quote where he talks about, our country is like an abiku country, like the spirit child, it keeps coming and going. And this kind of captures all the coups and counter coups that were in the continent um, in the 70s, when military dictatorships became um, the political reality of the day in many parts of the continent. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of um, these various generations that, that I'm talking about here. Now, <clears throat> now, if I may just also put out another quote that, that is going to capture what we are about to try and, and grapple with. Um, it's a quote from Neil Lazarus, who says that, unless we grasp the huge significance that the reattainment of nationhood carried for African intellectuals in these years of decolonization, it's almost impossible for us to understand the subsequent trajectory of modern African literature. We cannot make sense of the problematic of post-colonialism in this literature unless we read it as relating very concretely and immediately to the hiddenness of initial expectations of independence. I think this captures um, a lot of what most of these writers we're going to be talking about who considered themselves intellectuals at the time uh, were trying to grapple with. There was a, a question of nationalism and the literature that is going to foster that idea of nationalism the narratives that are going to be put together, um, piece together a past that has been influenced by, by colonialism, uh, a past before that that might have been inaccessible on print that is going to then be uh, incorporated into a kind of a new story of the nation at the time. And it's through the, the field of fiction and through literature that many of these writers were able to play around uh, with history. History did not become simply a documented discipline. Uh, they were able to tap into other, other archives, whether it is stories that were told by uh, their grandparents and great-grandparents, stories that were passed down from one generation to the other. And this thing called the nation state, which had been bequeathed to them, um, it was like a chimera. It was something that no one could figure out. No one had had it before. No one could figure out how to bring all of these diverse languages and cultures and different kinds of archives and history together. Right? And so one of the things that people like Ngugi 
and Aikwe Yama and Chinua Achebe began to think about was to think about national literature. So how does one begin to create um, national literature? So this quote for me really encapsulates the biggest concerns of this first generation of writers, the nation as a collective form of identity and the various forms of cultural nationalism that were uh, to, um, to be grappled with in that period. Um, are there, I should say that if you have any question, uh, if you'd like me to clarify anything, if anything piques your mind or your interest and you want to, just raise your hand and I will, I will stop and we can, we can um, engage. So um, a grain of wit, our text for today, I just called from the internet um, a, the cover of, of one of the editions of a grain of wit. And then and the one, and, and there's another photo of Ngugi Othiongo. Now, if you look at that cover, uh, you can see that there's a, there's a grass-thatched house, hut, and the, the policeman, there's someone with a gun, uh, they're trying to access that hut. This is a very iconic image. Um, in 1952, I think, when Jomo Kenyatta, the first president of Kenya, uh, was arrested and, and sent into political detention. And um, if you go online, you'll see videos of Jomo Kenyatta and a few others emerging from, from one of these huts. And then, you know, the British colonial policemen um, having arrested them at the time. So it's a, it's a very specifically selected image for this edition. Um, and it captures the, the kind of historical moment that a grain of wheat was trying to grapple with. Because from 1952, uh, the British colonial government declared a state of emergency on Kenya because of the, the, the Mau Mau revolt, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So what I'm going to do for the most part is just build context for you, and then at the end we can read some passages and try and, and see what the text is trying to, uh, to grapple with. I believe that most of these writers were very much concerned with context, and m most of uh, their, their experiences growing up as children very much informed um, you know, their novels. And so Ngugi was born in January 1938. Um, one of the things that is interesting is that Ngugi's family lived as squatters um, in what was declared crown land at the time. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ngugi is Kenyan, and so we are basically trying to grapple with the, uh, the history of Kenya at the time. Um, and Ngugi's family was involved with the uh, Mau Mau. I don't know if you've heard of the word Mau Mau. Yeah, just a show of hands, anyone who's heard of the Mau Mau? So Mau Mau was what, what was called a land and freedom army. Um, that, um, is it, that waged guerrilla warfare uh, on the British colonial government um, with a claim to um, um, get back the land from, um, from British colonialists at the time. And uh, um, many of the fighters who left their villages went into the forest, and therefore they would come out of the forest and they would um, try and wage guerrilla warfare on the British government on various colonial outposts that were in Kenya at the time. And one of the key figures of this time was a man called Deren Kimathi. He was supposedly the, the leader of this movement. Um, and when, when, when these fighters, whatever, as they call themselves, when they went into the forest, uh, the British government declared a state of emergency between 1952 and 1959, uh, where the movement of people uh, was, uh, was policed. The, um, obviously, the reason was to try and contain this, this, this rebellion in the forest and to try and arrest its leaders. So I took the liberty of um, getting something on, on, online about Deren Kimathi, and I'm just going to screen it now for you to see. Um. To the little town of Nairi in Kukuyu territory, Kenya police bring the biggest prize of the anti terrorist campaign, Deren Kimathi self-styled field marshal of the Mau Mau organization. Kimathi was wearing a leopard skin jacket and cap, half disguise, half uniform, when they ambushed and wounded him. His capture followed weeks of planning. The assistant police commissioner explains to pressmen how the net was tightened and the trap finally sprung. Police Corporal Wanjoni on the left was in command of the ambush and tribal policeman Ndirangu on the right fired the shot which brought the terrorist leader down. 500 pounds was the price on Dedan Kimathi's head and it's expected to go to the man who wounded him. Kimathi will be charged with carrying a lethal weapon, a capital offense in Kenya today. 
His capture will have a great psychological effect, for the Mau Mau leaders still at large are only small fry. Without Kimathi, Mau Mau's days are numbered. So basically that was the, uh, Darren Kimathi was the, uh, he was the, uh, the leader of the Mau Mau at the time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so if you're thinking of some of the, uh, uh, someone like Kihika in the novel, um, if you started reading the novel A Grain of Wheat, and the figure of Kihika is very much modeled on, uh, on Deran Kimathi. Um, and so it's, you know, that kind of history is what Ngugi sought to, um, to invoke in the novel. Uh, and I'm going to kind of break that down a little bit further. So Ngugi um, went to school, um, he, he went to high school in a school called Alliance, which was uh, set up in 1926, um, very early, early 20th century. Uh, and it was a school that uh, was set up by independent churches at the time. And so during the period of the emergency, Ngugi was at school. It was a boys' boarding school at the time. And of course, being in boarding school, um, getting the education that he was getting, the kind of conflict that that, that meant for him, um, kind of being in a kind of a modern European uh, school, but at the same time his brother, his half-brother, is out there fighting the same people who have created this framework of education for him. So during that period of, of, the, of the emergency, Ngugi was in, a, um, in school, and if you read through the novel, you can see that the, um, the authorial voice is very, very, very anxious and very, um, there's, 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 there's something ambiguous about that moment. Um, various ideas around complicity, betrayal, um, various forms of irony that we are going to unpack. And so afterwards, he ended up at uh, Makerere University in Uganda for his undergraduate. Uh, and then he went to Leeds, University of Leeds in the UK, where he did some postgraduate work. And then he went back to the University of Nairobi, um, where in, 19, in the late 70s, he began a movement to try and decolonize the curriculum of the, of the literature department uh, at the University of Nairobi. It's interesting that you know, what's been going on in South Africa in the past two years uh, is kind of deja vu for a lot of people who have other experiences from other parts of the continent. Uh, because what, what has been going on in the past two years um, was already happening in the, in the late 70s in other parts of the continent. So it's, it's interesting how these temporalities, how these times, um, one can work out a very interesting kind of um, um, study uh, on how South Africa's entry into, into postcoloniality uh, very much invokes earlier moments uh, of the post-colonial in other parts of the continent. Um, you know, so um, then he ended up, uh, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit further, Gugi ended up uh, getting detained, um, and he fled to exile um, uh, in the UK, and then eventually ended up in the US, where he is now, um, at the University of California at Irvine. And since then, he's gone back to Kenya time and again. Again, you know, the history of the country itself has obviously changed. Uh, from, the, from the late 70s now, uh, there's a much, much different picture um, in terms of the politics of the country and all that. So if I can just dive in straight into some of the kind of other contexts that, that form Gugi as a writer, as a person, as an intellectual. One of the key things that happens to Gugi in the 1960s that he, he embraces Marxism. And at that point, he renounces Christianity and he then um, renounces his English name, or his Christian name, uh, James. Um, initially, he published as James Ngugi, and he chose to drop James and um, refer to himself as Ngugi the Thiong. Uh, so it was a very significant ideological shift in the 60s for him. And he felt that um, he, needed to, um, he needed to begin representing the lower economic and social classes of Kenya. Um, in the late 60s and early 70s. And part of what this begins then is what we're calling the literature of disillusionment. The late 60s as a time that began to yield some of the failures of independence um, as you know, um, questions around corruption, around people who are not necessarily, who had not necessarily fought for the independence of the country who were then in power and who were very much a project of, um, um, of British colonialism in that regard. So, he began to represent the disillusionment of political independence and then this new world that came into the, into the picture in the late 60s, early 70s around neocolonialism. This idea that colonialism 
had not ended. It wasn't post-colonialism. It was a new form of colonialism. And so this is a term that then began to generate a lot of kind of theorizations of what it means to, uh, to grapple with the, you know, the period of after independence. And so Ngugi very much was influenced by theories around neocolonialism. And um, the other one was on dependency. And, and people like Walter Rodney, who were looking at many African nations are still very much dependent economically on their colonial masters. And I'm just giving a, a Walter Rodney's book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Some of the books that Ngugi read at the time that really, really influenced um, uh, um, his fiction at the time. And then, of course, Franz Fanon, a very big influence on Ngugi's life, particularly The Wretched of the Earth, which, if any of you have picked it up, uh, there's a chapter on, on national consciousness which tries to engage with questions of national culture. It tries to engage with um, the new and emerging middle class of the continent after independence and how empty this middle class um, had become, uh, simply acquiring and accumulating wealth. And so there was a big critique around the class dynamics that were beginning to emerge at the time. And then, of course, he also read Louis Althusser, who was a French Marxist, uh, on, on questions of ideology. If you read many of Ngugi's works, particularly the question of ideological state apparatuses and repressive state apparatuses, where Louis Althusser talks about any nation state as basically um, that, that every nation state, the way that it makes, the way that it produces citizenship is, is in two ways. It sets up ideological state apparatuses, which are schools and churches and other things that work on the mind. And then if that doesn't work out, it sets up, obviously, the repressive state apparatuses, the police and the army. And so Louis Althusser was reflecting on how citizenship is generated and loyalty to a particular nation state is generated by the state using this, these mechanisms. And so Ngugi really hopped onto that. And if you, for instance, read his novel called uh, Devil on the Cross, you begin to see many of these influences really come to the fore. So he embraced various strands of Marxism, Fanonian Marxism, um, Althusserian Marxism, um, and a range of others. Now, a grain of wheat is particularly important because he publishes a grain of wheat and then he realizes that he has reached a crisis. And when you read um, any of his other book of essays, he talks about publishing a grain of wheat as an important moment for him because he realized at the time that the audience that he was targeting at the time was not the one that um, um, a grain of wheat and his earlier novels was going to reach. So for instance, one of the th things that he decided at the time was to begin publishing in Gikuyu and to renounce publishing in English and publish originally in Gikuyu. And then maybe translations of those texts can then be done in English. And so a grain of wheat was his last novel to be originally written in English. And a grain of wheat is considered his most sophisticated, his most complex is most philosophical novel. Um, and you can see some of the influences in, in English literature. If you're thinking about uh, um, Conrad, if you're looking at how stream of consciousness and you know, um, you know, um, the, the kind of existential moment that, 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 that Ngugi is trying to capture, very much goes to some of those narrative techniques of people like Conrad. So he felt at the time that he needed to publish in a different language, he needed to target the audience in the country, the audience of, of you know, lower socioeconomic, lower socioeconomic classes of Kenyans at the time. And so he decided that he wasn't going to write in English. And if I can just screen another video here, that, um, about a five minute video where he talks about um, the question of language. And I'm going to talk about it as well in more detail in a moment. Um, so um, this was an interview that Ngugi had um, the BBC on Hard Talk. And, um, is this, you know, if all languages, for me, are very wonderful human creations, human achievement, whether it's English, Gujarati, Swahili, Kikuyu, wonderful languages, but the problem has been in a system of oppression and aggression, the languages and cultures are seen as a hierarchy. Some languages say, oh, we are better than another, you, my, we are better than that language, or uh, this culture is better than that, uh, higher, not even right. better, higher. Uh, so it's, it's in terms of hierarchy of power relationship 
between language. That's what, but, you know, not language, a particular language per se. Right, but the way, okay. but I wondered, yeah. you know, whether, that, as you know, uh, the great African writer Chinua Achebe took a very different view. Mm. He suggested that mm. uh, it wasn't quite the case that, mm. that you put, but also Ngozi Amanda Ndichie, mm. a younger Nigerian writer, right. mm. she says English is my language. She's taken over English, and I just wondered whether your your views of this were very much of that time, of the 50s and 60s. No. And the younger, younger yeah. African writers take a different English view. English is not an African language, full stop. One can say we adapt it and so on. In Nigeria, there's Yoruba, there's Ivo, in Kenya, there's Kikuyu, there's Luo. Indeed. We have genuine African languages. But Chimamanda Ngozi and uh, uh, just to quote uh, her, she says, right. English is mine. I have taken ownership of English. So she's kind of decolonized herself in a different no, way, hasn't she? She's part of the metaphysical empire. That's the whole point. But she's still colonized. Oh, no, no, no. Metaphysical empire is when people now begin to claim, you know, oh, this space is really, you know, mine and so on. And uh, that does not mean that what she does with English and what my son Mokomango does with the English is wonderful. I've no I've no doubt that what they're doing with the English language, but they are contribute but they should not we should not deceive ourselves. We are when we do that we are contributing to the expansion and deepening of English language, not Yoruba or Kikuyu right. or Kiswahili but, but and you, so on. <laughs> but, but there's a couple of points to that. Uh, uh, uh -huh. One is you translate your own works right. into English. So isn't that contributing to. No. Because, because you could get somebody else to do it. Because translation is a very, very important process how languages and cultures you know, communicate, okay? Uh, look at the contribution of translations to the rise of uh, European literatures and languages. From Latin, in the 17th century, in translation was very important to the rise of European languages. But you know. for you, if even Shakespeare would yeah. not have happened it, you have in the context of translation. But Gikuyu yeah. yeah. is, mm -hmm. is, for all its strengths and for all its importance in mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. means that you've got a very, very limited market of people who will ever read your work. Whereas mm -hmm. if you translate into English, you can be read broadly around the world. And oh, you do it yourself rather than get somebody else to a, do it. It's a fallacy. I mean, there's a notion that if you write in English, you get... Oh, well, what, you I'm trying say, what I'm trying to say is this. You can write in Zulu and the work can be translated into English, into French and so on. Let me ask you this. And the question I always ask people is this, you know. Can you or anybody else Imagine French literature in Zulu, you know, where you say, oh, this is French literature, but really it's written in Zulu, you know, or where, and do you know what's happening right now? There are very many prizes right now given to African literature. But do you know the condition? Written in they English. don't write in. So uh, we're going right. to promote African literature what? on condition that you don't use an African language. Right. This is crazy. Okay. <laughs> you know, let, honestly, let, I, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, talk, impossible. Let's, let's talk a little bit. Can about you think of English literature in Chinese? You say, oh, we well, don't want, we are promoting English literature, but it must be written in Chinese. Uh, <laughs> but I can think of Robert Burns, who writes an old Scottish, which yeah. nobody reads because right, it's not right. written in the English most people well, understand. But let, yeah. let's, let, right. let, let's move on to. Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't know what you make of that video, uh, but I just put it out there uh, because Ngugi has been a very central figure. Um, in debates around language in African literature. And but in the 60s, in the early 60s, in 1962 specifically, there was a conference that was held at uh, the University of Makerere in Uganda where African writers gathered and they were trying to figure out how, what kind of language is African literature going to express itself. And so at the time, um, there were different positions that people took. Ngugi, um, after the conference, two, three years after the conference, decided he was going to publish and write his novels in Gikuyu. Um, so there was the one group of people who decided that African literature should be articulated and expressed and created in African languages, primarily. And there were others like Shino Achebe who felt that they could use English, uh, panel beat it, play around with it, and make it represent the experiences of the continent. And there were others who took a middle ground and they, and they felt that a language like Swahili could be used as a as a kind of a lingua franca for the continent. 
So there were various positions that people took at the time. And of course, the debate is not the same then as it is now. Obviously, at the time, uh, the uh, it, African literature, modern African literature, was not as, um, that there wasn't as many works that had been published at the time. Um, curriculums in schools were still being set up. And so it was about setting the agenda for African literature. And so Ngugi was quite central at the time. And what is remarkable about him is that he's maintained, after a grain of wheat, he's published primarily in Gikuyu, um, and then had his own works translated into English. So he's a very important figure. So the language debate it was a very important debate for this first generation of, of African writers. And of course, the debate changes with time. Yes? Um, just last year, Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I can send you material. There's a lot. Um, that video was really just a moment that, that I was using to try and touch on that. Um, there's there a whole range of debates in the early 60s, as you might know, um, in various academic journals, in various, in various platforms. But I, I just wanted to flag that, because talking about a grain of wheat, we're not going to necessarily talk about language, the language debate. Uh, I think that needs another set of lectures. So it's just something that I'm flagging to say that Ngugi's Ngugi, as, a, as, as, as an important figure in that debate, um, is still, you know, um, is one of the things that one has to consider when they talk about Ngugi. So there are questions around language, genre, and audience. And Ngugi felt that instead of writing, the project of writing back to kind of colonial history, he felt that new African writers needed to begin targeting audiences in the continent and writing for those audiences in languages that would then be supposedly um, um, native to, to the continent. And so the question of audience becomes then important for Ngugi. And so he also begins to think that the genre of the novel does not necessarily allow him to reach a broader range of people. And so he sets up a theater, a traveling theater group called the Kamiridu Traveling Theater Group, where he um, uh, uh, performs a play, uh, which was later translated to I'll Marry When I Want. And he involves members of the community at the time. And there was community participation. and. The, the, the main reason why he set up this play was to try and initiate some political consciousness uh, amongst um, people on the ground about the failures of independence, about the, the expectations that people had, and the, the rising social ills of the new nation. And so it's in 1977, after this play was performed by community members, that Ngugi ended up in detention. Right? And it's there then that um, he was in a maximum security prison, and it was there that he then published his first novel in Gikuyu called Devil on the Cross. Well, in Gikuyu, it's, it's a whole different um, title altogether. But this was the first novel that he published primarily, originally, in Gikuyu. Um, and so just, that is a, I just wanted to give you a quick sense of where Ngugi was coming from at the time and how A Grain of Wit then becomes an important work. But apart from A Grain of Wit, a grain of wit and Devil on the Cross, I'm just listing a whole range of other uh, creative work that Ngugi has, has published. The River Between, Whip Not Child, The Black Hermit, Secret Lives, Petals of Blood, The Trial of Dead and Kimathi, Wizard of the Crow, which um, came out, I think, five or six years back. Uh, and Wizard of the Crow, um, he published Wizard of the Crow almost 20 years, more than 20 years after publishing his last novel um, um, in 1987. So it was during that period of exile that he 
you know, uh, didn't publish anything until uh, almost, almost 30 years later, Wizard of the Crow, which was also initially published in, in Gikuyu. So for your own reading, you can just look at, at some of those novels. And then he also has published uh, various books of essays, and um, I'm just giving examples there, Writers in Politics, uh, Detained, A Writer's Prison Diary, Decolonizing the Mind, um, other examples of um, academic writing and essays that he's written. And if you read them, you'll see that in many of these essays, he reflects on his own craft. Um, Gugi is an interesting figure in that regard, that he's able to um, occupy this entire, this ecosystem as a creative writer, as a critic, um, um, as a public intellectual. Uh, so he's a very interesting figure in that regard. Now, what are some of the critical contexts uh, that, that I've been trying to invoke? Gugi's project of history basically entailed trying to grapple with history from below. The kind of colonial history that, that was going to be bequeathed to the new nation from Gugi had to be undercut. For him, the history that was going to take the country forward was a history that was experienced by the lower social and economic classes of the country at the time. And so for him, how this history was going to be generated was obviously the kind of classic Marxist um, idea of class conflict. Um, and he felt that uh, history is an ideological project. And so his novels uh, have the connections between history and ideology as a very important kind of um, nexus. And so history, ideology, and agency, how does, how does history and ideology in the way that they connect give the lower socioeconomic classes of the society more agency as historical actors? And so I'll just have a quote there from a critic that says, in the earlier novels, Ngugi brings out the moral dilemma that confronts his heroes in their efforts to reconcile two antagonistic social groups in their society. And so, you know, uh, just quickly captures Ngugi's um, project of history there. And so, how does one recuperate, how does one talk about the heroes of independence? How does one begin to muddy the waters? And if you read A Grain of Wheat, you, you'll see that there are various heroes who are not necessarily heroes, and they, they are people who ended up sacrificing themselves. It's the question of heroism as generating national history becomes important for Mugi. And so someone like Mugo in the novel becomes this, the irony of course of, with Mugo and when we start reading the novel is that we know that Mugo is actually a traitor and that Mugo's, um, Mugo's you know, um, celebration in the society is in fact quite ironical for people, people do not know the things that he has done until, so the story then becomes a narrative that you know, tries to unpack Mugo's existential crisis um, and at the end of the novel it becomes a big scandal um, um, and many, many, you know, African countries at the time were, were having to grapple with that historical crisis. Where does one find different stories that will contest the ones that have been bequeathed to them, either by the colonial state or by new African leaders at the time? And so there's also the question of the right and the nation and the question of cultural nationalism. And I'm just putting out another quote there that says, Ngugi's earlier novels as text written under the shadow of nationalism, whose creation involved a process of invention, which was both contradictory and ambiguous. They were texts born in the throes of the problematic nationalist discourse of the early 1960s. The texts bear the scars of these contradictions and complex imaginings of nationalism. And I think the, key, the, two, the, the one key word there is ambiguity. The other one is contradiction. I think a grain of wheat really embodies those two words, right? And then um, the central motif in the narratives Ngugi produced between 1963 and 1968 was that of the homeward journey made by ex-detainees who returned to their villages with longing and expectation only to discover that home was no longer the hearth they had dreamt it would be, but a site of radical displacement. Throughout a grain of wheat you see this motif of return. Mugo uh, returning from detention during the state of emergency. Gikonyo in the novel also returning to his home uh, after the state of emergency. And so the motif of return generates a tension between the expectation, expectations of these people when they're returning back to their homes and their societies after a period of time and the, uh, the, the crisis of, of this idea of freedom that they, they confront. They realize that society is no longer the same. It's, it's changed. Uh, one would assume that in South Africa in the late 90s and early 2000s, we are beginning to see now some of the tensions uh, of this question of return, expectations, desires, and hopes, and how South African history itself 
becomes very contested. Um, and some of the other archives that people are digging up are beginning to generate some really, really interesting narratives. I don't know if um, um, any of you have read, uh, um, there's a, a, a book of nonfiction called Askari by, uh, by uh, what's his name? Um, Jacob Lamini. Has anyone read Askari? Have you seen the, it's, it's one of those narratives that tries to grapple with the, the ambiguities and the contradictions of South Africa. Yes. Jacob Lamini. Lamini, D-L-A-M-I-N-I. -I. Uh, it's Askari, and Askari obviously is a, is a Swahili word for, for a policeman. And it's, it's a, it, it comes out of the colonial archive, the British colonialism in East Africa, in Kenya and, and Tanzania. The figure of the Askari was the figure of, of the traitor um, at the time. So a grain of wheat, the historical period that it's grappling with is the state of emergency in Kenya between 1952 and 1959. Um, and this is, you know, um, obviously, as I pointed out, when Mao Mao broke out, the, the revolt broke out, and uh, uh, the British government decided to declare a state of emergency to try and, um, and contain the rebellion. And so a grain of wheat taps into the crisis that that moment generated for people who are involved, who are arrested and detained and tortured, for those who collaborated, a grain of wheat is very much uh, encapsulated in that moment. Um, and so w one can also think about post-World War II. Um, some of the people in, in that society who had fought in the Second World War, who had come back and then gone into the forest, there are a few figures in the novel who invoke post-World War II. And obviously, after World War II, the world kind of changed. There was a radical um, crisis after World War II, especially in the continent, for returning soldiers who had fought for various colonial powers, coming back and therefore militarizing movements of independence. So it was a very big effect, World War II. And, and part, of what, part of this crisis of the state of emergency comes from the effects of, of, of World War II. And as I pointed out, Mao Mao considered itself as a land and freedom army. And uh, one of the things that a grain of wheat taps into as well is Ngugi's family history in relation to the period. Uh, if you read Ngugi's family history, you'll see him invoking some of those moments uh, in the text. And the text itself is very aware of itself. And so I'm talking about the paratexts, the ones that, uh, the other texts that um, um, are on the cover and, and, and epilogues and monologues and um, 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 epilogues and prologues, they play a part in trying to frame the narrative itself. If I can just give an example here. Um, so if you look at the, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see the board, but this is the first. So these are, these are some of the texts that kind of give you a sense of how Ngugi is framing this narrative. So there's a, there's a quote from 1 Corinthians there that says, thou fool that which thou sawest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat, which is where he takes the title from, or of some other grain. And then there's a, there's a writer's, there's an author's note at the bottom that says, although set in contemporary Kenya, all the characters in this book are fictitious. Names like that of Jomo Kenyatta and Waiyaki are unavoidably mentioned as part of the history and the institutions of our country. But the situation and the problems are real, sometimes too painfully real for the peasants who fought the British, yet who now see all that they fought for being put on one side. And I think that captures the, the tone of the novel um, as it begins to, uh, to unfold. And I mean, you can see the first line, it says, Mugo felt nervous. If he was lying on his back and looking at the roof. I mean, it's already generating an anxiety in the beginning. And we know that Mugo embodies that kind of anxiety, ambiguity, the moral crisis of this period of independence. And we know that he's a, he's a very complex figure. When he begins to unpack himself, um, we realize that, uh, that this society, in that moment of celebrating independence, um, is looking at a very, very um, ambiguous future. And you know, um, one can go on and on. Um, and so, um, if you look at Ngugi's other novels, um, so, so Ngugi renounces Christianity 
in the, in the late 60s. But obviously the Bible is quite central as a text, as a kind of an intertextual reference in many of his novels. Devil on the Cross, from the title Devil on the Cross, already is trying to you know, engage with a kind of a, a biblical storytelling. And so for him, the Bible, what he does with it is quite important and quite interesting because the Bible was one of the most translated texts in the world, right? And in the continent. And during the period of colonial occupation, between 18, when was the Berlin Conference? Does anyone remember? 1884, right? During the Berlin, con from 1884 when um, European powers sat together and decided to dish out Africa. Between 1884 and 1960, the Bible was translated into hundreds of languages in the continent, sometimes even dialects. In one area, one district, if there are 10 dialects, the Bible would then be translated into very, so earlier forms of literacy for many African writers were very much involved, involved reading the Bible. So the Bible was an important text, right? And so Ngugi uses the Bible as a popular text, not as a religious or, or as a, as a, not as a, as a religious text, but as a, as, as a popular text. He uses stories from the Bible because he's aware that people in the country would have read the stories, would have heard of them, and so he uses them as metaphors to try and grapple with the crisis of independence. And throughout, um, you know, A Grain of Wheat, Devil on the Cross, Petals of Blood, um, um, I forget the one that was published in 1987, you see that the Bible really figures, but not as a religious text. So it's an interesting uh, project of textuality that Ngugi is trying to, to grapple with here. So, you know, uh, just to break down some of the uh, issues in the text, the, the question of cultural nationalism versus arrested decolonization, where at the moment of independence, many of the people who felt that they had fought for independence and who felt that they needed to invent or construct uh, a culture of the, of the new nation that is emerging, uh, when they begin to realize that the process of decolonization was more complicated and it was more difficult, then that, that's where some of the tensions began to arise. So they, if you read through a grain of wheat, you can see Kihika as a figure is kind of allegorical, he embodies a kind of cultural nationalism of a new nation that is emerging. Whereas Mugo, on the other hand, who's a sharp contrast, embodies a kind of process of arrested decolonization already. He's already compromised as a figure who's being celebrated as one of the heroes of independence. And so these two, for me, generate uh, interesting uh, um, tensions in the novel. And of course, the time of the novel, um, we know that it's um, the present time of the novel is a few days before Kenya get its, gets its, its independence. But the time in which it taps into is the state of emergency between 1952 and 1959. So the text itself at the present, it's set in 1963. But of course, it's frozen uh, in the state of emergency as a time that affected many of the characters in the novel. And so the question of betrayal then becomes, uh, uh, is generated out of that time. People like Mugo uh, ended up being national betrayers. And this is part of the influence of reading Fanon. Um, Fanon has a chapter in Wretched of the Earth called national consciousness, or national consciousness, where the pitfalls of national consciousness, where he talks extensively about the, this, this crisis of betrayal, when independent, independence comes and the people who are considered heroes or the people who are considered subjects of history become themselves discovered as very compromised in that regard. So decolonization then began to come across as an empty shell and, and the, the spectacle of independence, the, the Union Jack being lowered at the night of independence. And this was a practice across many African countries, from Ghana in 1957, when Ghana got its independence. If you go online, you'll see uh, at that moment when the, the, you know, the independence is being equipped, uh, bequeathed uh, to, um, to Ghana, um, the lights are shut down in the stadium, the Union Jack is lowered, the, the new Ghana, Ghanaian flag uh, is hoisted up. And you'll see that practice across many other African countries. And it's a spectacle, obviously. And of course, Ngugi, in this book, particularly in the last chapter, I think chapter 14, is trying to grapple with that spectacle in relation to the simmering tensions and anxieties and ambiguities and compromise that this, this moment of spectacle was going to inherit. Uh, and that's, that's another interesting kind of tension, the ghosts of colonialism that um, begin to uh, and if you read through the novel, particularly chapter 14, the uncertainty, the doubt <clears throat> as embodying the project of decolonization. 
the future of the nation itself was already in doubt. The uncertainty of all of these figures who were considered the heroes uh, of independence become then what embodies the, the, the spirit of decolonization. But on the other hand, there's the authority of cultural nationalism. And I've pointed out earlier, Kihika and Mugo as two contrasting figures in this regard. And then, of course, the irony of return versus uh, questions around origin and tradition. Uh, how do you return to a, to a society that you think um, was the same when you left? And has, it has radically changed. Um, I'm just giving an example of uh, Chinua Achebe's uh, Okonkwo in Things Fall Apart. I don't know how many people have read Okon uh, Things Fall Apart, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. If you remember when Okonkwo returns from exile in Banta, he comes back to Umuafia and he just, he's in the margins. When before that, he was a very central figure in the society. He was a titled elder. He was, um, he was very much uh, in the political, economic, and social framework of that society, a very important figure. But then he goes into exile seven years, comes back. The uh, British colonialism has already set its roots in Umuafia, um, and he just can't deal. He ends up um, quite tragically committing suicide at the end of the novel. Right? And it's interesting that questions around sacrifice, the ambiguity of that moment at the end of things fall apart. Does Okonko commit suicide because he's a coward? Uh, does he then become that sacrificial figure um, of this society that has to die for this society to move on? Um, if you're thinking about, in a grain of wit, if you're thinking about Mugo, Mugo's, at the end of the novel, I don't know how many people have read up to the end of the novel, he ends up being taken away and, and he ends up obviously being killed. Uh, but we know that Kihika had also sacrificed himself. Uh, Kihika, the other character in the novel, who embodies cultural nationalism, the, the Mau Mau and all of that, also ends up getting sacrificed. So the question of sacrifice opens up a lot of ambiguous questions around the future of this country. Um, often I hear in South Africa uh, the question of struggle credentials. Uh, do you have struggle credentials? Do you not? And, and you know. Um, Right, so just another quote there, um, as we think we have about five minutes. Um, I'm just wrapping up. The way in which the motif of return works in the story is to valorize nostalgia as a way of dealing with radical dislocation. On the eve of decolonization, colonial subjects return home to find out that the world they secured, their old identities, um, has collapsed. They hence assume that somehow the world of childhood and youth the world before the state of emergency was preferable to the new state of uncertainty engendered by the collapse of colonial rule. And this kind of captures what I've been trying to say before that. And of course, I've been invoking um, the kind of narrative modes that Ngugi uses in a grain of wit, allegory and irony, <clears throat> the allegory of, of, of the emerging nation and the irony of what the period of decolonization that the nation is getting into. And of course, Mugo presents the, is the archetype of the moral crisis of decolonization, but he's also an allegorical figure. When we, when we meet him at first, we are told that he's celebrated in the village, the women sing songs for him, they compose praise poetry for him uh, because of one act of, 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 um, of revolt against the British that he had performed many years before during the period of emergency, the state of emergency. But all of these people don't know that Mugo is the one who ends up giving up Kehika. He ends up giving up Kihika to the colonial authorities. And so they think that Mugo and Kihika were speaking from the same script. But it turns out that uh, Mugo is not the allegory of this new nation, but it is, in fact, the irony of this new nation as a figure. Right? Um, so you know, I'm just putting out the, the emergency as generating uh, a temporal archive of feeling. Um, there's a complicity between us readers, people who are reading the novel, because when we start reading the novel, we can see Mugo is nervous. All the other people can't see it. And there's a kind of, I don't know if it's a dramatic irony. Um, and there's something complicit about our knowledge of Mugo's hectic betrayal of the nation and him being celebrated as, as an important figure, as um, you know, the sacrifice of the nation, as someone who is a leader of that nation. So there's, there's all these narrative strategies that uh, make us partially complicit. And of course, you, 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 when you read the novel, you'll see that Ngugi keeps changing the, the, um, the, um, the narrative um, positioning in the novel. There are moments when he adopts uh, a collective uh, kind of narrative subjectivity. There are moments when you can, you can tell that it's a, 
uh, um, it's a 